All right, so um, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Welcome to, uh, welcome everyone. And this is our third uh, law science event. I'm Vanessa Villanueva. I'm a JSD candidate from the University of Illinois at the College of Law, and I will be the moderator for this session. Uh, I will start this session with a brief introduction of the Law Science Project. This is an academic initiative that has been coordinated by a group of JSD candidates who share the same beliefs in legal methodologies, which is often understood as a discipline distinct from hard sciences and traditionally consisting of doctrinal analysis and normative questions. So the Law Science Project aims to show through this series of interdisciplinary talks that legal research can be improved and benefit from the scientific uh, method, providing systemic ways to approach questions and deliver falsifiable claims. If you want to know more about this Law Science Project, please visit our website. Someone is gonna drop it on the chat box now. And you can also join our mailing list. Law Science uh, is currently collaborating with the World Interdisciplinary Network for Institutional Research. I'm part of, as a representative of Law Science in the Young Scholars Committee. And soon by the end of the weekend, we will be announcing a very interesting call for action directed to doctoral candidates in different disciplines that will receive feedback, meaningful feedback from senior scholars. Again, if you are interested in having more information, please subscribe to the project. You will receive an email with additional information about the call. So to continue today's session, I would like to introduce my uh, colleagues and coordinators, uh, Patrick Chuncha Wan. He is a JSD candidate from the law school at the University of Chicago. Uh, Daniel Hefke, he is a JSD candidate from Cornell Law School, and Simon Sun, who is an SJD uh, candidate at the Indiana University Morris School of Law and co-founder of this initiative. We also have today representatives of the JSD and JSP programs from the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Virginia. I also want to introduce today Kathy, Kathy Kim, she is also as an SJD candidate and coordinator at the Graven Colloquium at Mara School of Law. And today we are very honored to have Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. He is Dean at Berkeley Law, my uh, alma mater during my LLM program, which is, uh, us, uh, which is uh, with us today for our third spring event of law science. So Dean Chemerinsky is the 13th Dean of Berkeley Law. He joined the faculty as the Jesse H. Schopper Distinguished Professor of Law. Prior to this appointment, he was the founding dean and distinguished professor of law and uh, Raymond Prick, uh, Professor of First Amendment Law at the University of California Irvine School of Law. He was also professor of law and political science at Duke University and professor of law at the University of Southern California Law School and DePaul College of Law. Dinch Marinsky is also a contributing writer of, uh, to multiple journals and columns. He frequents op-eds appear in newspapers across the country. He also argues appellate cases, including the United States Supreme Court. In uh, 2016, he was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2017, the National Jurist Magazine again named uh, Dean Chemerinsky as the most influential person in legal education in the United States. In 2022, so recently last year, he was also the president of the Association of American Law Schools. He's an incredibly uh, prolific uh, author of 16 books, including leading casebook and treatises about constitutional law, criminal procedure, and federal jurisdiction. His most recent books are uh, Wars Than Nothing, The Dangerous Fallacy of Originalism and Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights. And today he is gonna present his latest and debated book, Wars Than Nothing, The Dangerous Fallacy of Originalism. So without further ado, just bear with me that I need to switch uh, devices. Um, please, Dean Chmerinsky, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. My instructions are I'll talk for, oh, about 35 minutes and then leave the rest of the time for questions and discussion, if that works for you. But if people have questions while I'm going along and don't wanna wait, I'm also glad for you to raise your hand. It'll be easier for me if either you raise your hand to ask questions 
or if they're put in the Q&A or chat, if somebody could read them to me, um, hard for me to read them and then be able to respond. In 1987, Robert Bork was rejected for a seat on the United States Supreme Court because of his original views with regard to the Constitution. Bork had impeccable credentials. He'd been a law professor at University of Chicago and then at Yale Law School. He was the Solicitor General of the United States during the Nixon administration. He was a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Nonetheless, more senators voted against his confirmation than against the nomination of any other Supreme Court nominee in history. 58 senators, Democrats and Republicans, voted to defeat Bork's confirmation. They did so entirely because of Bork's originalist philosophy. Originalism is the view that the meaning of a constitutional provision is fixed when it's adopted, that it can change only through the amendment process. So Bork had said that there's no protection of privacy rights, such as the regard to contraception or abortion. Bork had taken the position that there's no protection against sex discrimination, equal protection, because the original meaning was just about race discrimination. Bork took the position that the First Amendment and freedom of speech was just about protecting political speech and nothing else. Today, not that many years later, there are three justices on the Supreme Court who are self-avowed originalists, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, and Amy Coney Barrett. And there are three other justices on the court who often write in originalist terms and certainly join opinions written in originalist terms. And that would be Chief Justice John Roberts and just Samuel Alito and Brett Kavanaugh. We saw this in the last term of the Supreme Court. There was a single week the end of June, when the Supreme Court made monumental changes in constitutional law. And it's stunning, much they came down to the court's originalist philosophy. On Thursday, June 23rd, the Supreme Court decided New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. It involved a New York law adopted in 1907 that said in order for someone to have a gun in public, they need a permit. In order to get a permit, the person would need to show a safety need for having the gun. The Supreme Court declared that unconstitutional is violating the Second Amendment. It was a six to three decision. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote for the court. Justice Stephen Breyer wrote for the three liberals. Justice Thomas said that the Second Amendment protects the right to have guns in public. That includes concealed weapons, that a state cannot condition having a weapon in public on showing a safety need. If that's all the court had done, it would be quite significant. But then the court went on to what should be the test in evaluating government regulation of firearms. Usually when there's a fundamental right involved or discrimination against the suspect class, like on race, the government has to meet strict scrutiny. It has to show a compelling interest and no other way to achieve it. But Justice Thomas said that the court's not gonna use the levels of scrutiny here it's going to use purely a historical test. Was the gun regulation of a type that had been allowed in 1791 when the Second Amendment was ratified or in 1868? We've already seen the effects of that. But three weeks ago, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in the United States versus Rahimi declared unconstitutional a federal law that made it a federal crime for a person under a restraining order in a domestic violence case from having a gun. The Fifth Circuit said no such regulations existed in 1791 or 1868, so they're impermissible today. The next day, Friday, June 24th, the Supreme Court decided Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. As you know, in that case, the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade. Justice Samuel Alito, writing for a five person majority, said that a right should be protected under the Constitution only if it's in the text or part of the original meaning or a long unbroken historical tradition. He said, abortion rights don't fit in any of those categories and thus there's no constitutional protection for abortion. Three days later on Monday, June 27th, the Supreme Court decided Kennedy versus Bremerton schools. It involved a high school football coach, Joseph Kennedy, who would go onto the field after games and kneel and pray. 
He's often joined by players from his team, sometimes players from the other team. The school asked him to stop that, being concerned about the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, that the government take no action respecting establishment of religion. Kennedy sued, and he won in the Supreme Court in a 6-3 decision. Justice Neil Gorsuch, for the majority, Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote for the liberal dissenters. Justice Gorsuch said it violated the coach's free speech rights and free exercise of religion to punish him for the public prayer. What about the Establishment Clause? For 60 years, the Supreme Court had said that prayer in public schools, even voluntary prayer, violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Justice Gorsuch said, what violates the Establishment Clause is to be determined by, quote, the views of the Founding Fathers. So the only question is, would a particular practice have been found to violate the Establishment Clause in 1791? I hope these three cases demonstrate the ascendancy of originalism on the Supreme Court. What I want to argue to you this morning is that originalism is a terrible way of approaching the Constitution. Let me give several reasons, then conclude by talking about what's the alternative to originalism, and then be glad to take your questions and comments. The first problem that I identify with originalism is what I call the abhorrence problem. Following originalism would lead to abhorrent results in many cases. Think of the following examples. Brown versus Board of Education. Loving versus Virginia. Obergefell versus Hodges. Constitutional prohibition of discrimination based on sex or sexual orientation. None of those cases would come out the same way under originalism. Take Brown versus Board of Education. To me, it's the epitome of why we have a Supreme Court. The Supreme Court on May 17, 1954, declared unconstitutional state laws requiring segregation in education. The problem, of course, with this from an originalist perspective is that the same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment also voted to segregate the District of Columbia public schools. There's not a shred of evidence that the original meaning of the 14th Amendment was meant to outlaw segregation. The Supreme Court had asked for a briefing on the question of what was the original meaning of the Equal Protection Clause with regard to segregation. And then having seen the answer, the court said, it's irrelevant. Chief Justice Earl Warren writing for the court said, we can't set the clock back to 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson was decided, or 1868 when Brown was when um, the 14th Amendment was adopted. And the court said that separate can never be equal, regardless of the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. Take Loving versus Virginia as an example. Loving was a 1967 case that declared unconstitutional of Virginia law prohibiting interracial marriage. Again, there's no evidence that the original meaning of the 14th Amendment was to outlaw such laws. Most states had laws prohibiting interracial marriage. California had a law prohibiting interracial marriage until 1948. In 1967, when Loving was decided, 16 states still had laws prohibiting interracial marriage. If one was an originalist, Loving was wrongly decided. Obergefell versus Hodges, the 2015 case, that states cannot prohibit same-sex marriage. No one believes that that could be justified from an originalist perspective. That's why the originalists on the court, just Scalia, just Thomas, vehemently dissented. Or take the example of using equal protection as a way of combating discrimination on grounds of sex or sexual orientation. Just as Scalia said on many occasions, that the Equal Protection Clause doesn't apply to prohibit discrimination based on sex or sexual orientation. He said the purpose of the Equal Protection Clause was just to stop race discrimination. In fact, in the Slaughterhouse cases in 1873, the Supreme Court said it was unthinkable that equal protection would ever be used against anything other than discrimination against those of African descent. I would suggest to you that a theory of constitutional interpretation that makes Brown and Loving 
in Obergefell, when the prohibition of discrimination against sex and sexual orientation illegitimate is a method of constitutional interpretation we must reject. Well, it we can move on to a second problem that I identify with the originalism. In this, I'd call an epistemological problem. Originalism assumes that there is an original meaning that's out there to be discovered. But the reality is there rarely is an original meaning. Rarely would there have been agreement in 1787 or 1791 or 1868 is what a constitutional provision meant. Originally, when it was first developed, originalism focused on the framers' intent. What did the men, and they were all white men, have in mind when they ratified the Constitution. But quickly, this was criticized. So many men were involved in drafting or ratifying constitutional revision. How can it be said there was a collective intent? Originals then said they shift, would shift, and instead of focusing on the views of the framers, they would ascertain the original public meaning. Now, it's important to note that the Supreme Court is equivocal. Sometimes it still talks about framers' intent. As I mentioned in Kennedy versus Bremerton schools on June 27, 2022, Justice Gorsuch said the meaning of the establishment clause is determined by the views of the founding fathers. That's very much framers' intent originalism. But one, whether one looks at the framers' intent or searches for an original public meaning, it's usually going to be elusive rarely is going to be a clear answer to the question. I can speak of this from some personal experience. In 1997, voters in Los Angeles decided to elect a commission to draft a new city charter. In California, a charter is much like a constitution. It creates the institutions of city government. It allocates power among them. In many ways, it prescribes how the government will function. It even can provide more rights than the U.S. or the state constitution. I ran for election. I was one of seven candidates in my city council district to run. Amazingly, I got elected. There were 15 commissioners, and then I was chosen to be the chair of the commission. And we worked for two years to draft a new charter. It went before the voters in June of 1999. It was approved. It remains the charter for the city of Los Angeles. Almost immediately, questions arose as to what we intended with particular provisions. The answer virtually always is, we didn't think about that. There was, just soon after the charter was adopted, a question about the meaning of one sentence with regard to term limits. And I got called from the litigants on both sides, and I said, we just never thought about that issue. The judge resolved the case saying, the intent of the voters in Los Angeles, I can assure you no voter in Los Angeles thought about that one sentence in a hundred page document. It was purely a fiction. I continue to get calls and emails to this day when issues come up as to the meaning of the city charter provision. Rarely do the questions involve things that we thought about. Now, so many years later, often I don't remember what we talked about, but if I do, and I say, oh, yeah, I remember we talked about this, and this is what I think we meant. If the lawyer likes it, the lawyer will say, will you write a declaration saying that? And the lawyer doesn't like it, the lawyer will say, um, never mind, and keep searching for other commissioners till the lawyer can find one. It'll say what the lawyer wants. That's what goes on with regard to originalism. The justices, lower court judges, look through the historical record to find support for the position they want to come to. The late judge Patricia Wald said that this kind of history is like going to a cocktail party. When you go to a cocktail party, you look for your friends. Well, when a justice or a judge is doing this kind of originalism, they look through the historical record to find what supports the conclusion they want to come to. Originalists pride themselves on saying they have a methodology that constrains the justices. It's nonsense because the justices just look through the historical record to come to the conclusion that they've already started with. Think about the cases that I mentioned, or you can think about the cases from the end of last term more generally. 
where the Supreme Court said that in certain circumstances, the government is constitutionally required to subsidize religious schools, that there's broad protection of gun rights, there's no abortion rights, there's a the right of the high school football coach to pray, there's great limits on the power of administrative agencies. Unless you believe that the framers' intent in 1787 71 was the same as the Republican platform today, what you see is the conservative justices came to their conservative conclusion, searched through the historical record to cherry pick what would support their conclusions, and then wrote that in their opinion. But that's not something that constrains the justices in any way. And that epistemological problem is inevitable under originalism. A third problem that I would identify with regard to originalism, I would call the incoherence problem. Let me start with a simple way to explain this. I think there is compelling evidence that the framers of the Constitution did not intend for their views to be controlling in the future. James Madison took the official notes of the Constitutional Convention. He instructed they not be open until after his death. In fact, the members of the Constitutional Convention decided to proceed in secret and to observe confidentiality requirement. Scholars have argued, I think, persuasively that the founders of the Constitution did not have in mind originalism as a way of interpreting the Constitution. Jeff Powell, a professor at Duke, wrote an article in the Harvard Law Review about 40 years ago titled The Original Understanding of Original Understanding. Boris Bitger, a professor at Yale, made the same argument. It's an elegant argument. It says, if one is an originalist, then one has to follow the framers' views of interpreting the Constitution. The framers didn't intend originalism. Therefore, if you're an originalist, you have to reject originalism. Now, the problem, of course, in discussing this is that the Constitution doesn't mention the power of judicial review. It never says that courts have the power to declare unconstitutional executive or legislative acts. So it's hard to say, what did the framers have in mind as to how judicial review should be done when they didn't create the institution of review? They didn't talk about judicial review. To me, that's the inherent underlying incoherence of originalism. There is a fourth problem with originalism, and I would call it the modernity problem. And it's the impossibility of applying a constitution written in 1787 or 1791 to our modern world. It is so vastly different than the constitution that was intended. Let me again give you examples. There was a case before the Supreme Court about a decade ago, Brown versus Entertainment Merchants, involved a California law that prohibited selling or renting a violent video game to a minor under 18 without parental consent. And Justice Scalia was pressing the attorneys about the original meaning of the First Amendment. And finally, Justice Alito interrupted that exchange and said, what Justice Scalia really wants to know is, what did James Madison think of violent video games? Just to ask the question shows its absurdity. I'll go back to the examples that I mentioned in my introduction. New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. Got a call from a reporter just day before yesterday about a case that's pending now about whether or not California can ban semi-assault weapons like the AR-15. And the judge is asking the question, what did the framers of the Second Amendment have in mind with regard to weapons like the AR-15? No weapon of such mass destruction existed in 1791. If you think about the weapons of 1791, they're so different than an AR-15, which has little purpose but to kill a large number of people in a short period of time. Or the Fifth Circuit case I mentioned from three weeks ago. It's a federal law that says that those under restraining orders in domestic violence cases can't possess a firearm. There's strong evidence that this law has saved many women's lives in domestic violence situations. The Fifth Circuit said, no such law existed in 1791 and that therefore this is unconstitutional. But of course, 
there wasn't protection for women, domestic violence situations like this in 1791. Indeed, women weren't part of the constitutional drafting or ratification process. Women didn't have the right to vote until 1920. A married woman was considered the property, the channel of her husband. Why should our modern world be governed by what people thought just in 1791? But take another example, which fits many of the problems I'm identifying with regard to originalism, and that's Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. It was a 2010 decision of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held that corporations have the First Amendment right to spend unlimited amounts of money in election campaigns to get the candidates they want elected or defeated. Corporations, as we know them today, didn't exist in 1791. More important, campaign spending in elections, as we know it today, didn't exist in 1791. So why does it make any sense to say that the meaning of the First Amendment today is limited to what they thought in 1791. It's a different world with different problems. And I could go through all aspects of the Constitution and say that there weren't analogs to so many of the issues that are faced, and that therefore originalism faces an inherent modernity problem. A fifth problem that I'd identify with originalism is what I would call hypocrisy problem. The conservative justices abandon originalism when it doesn't get to the conservative results they want. I just gave you the example of Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. I don't think there is a plausible way of defending that decision on originalist grounds. There's no reason to believe that the framers of the First Amendment thought that spending by corporations was constitutionally protected. It didn't exist then. And yet that didn't stop the conservatives on the Supreme Court from finding the federal law, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act that limited corporate spending to be unconstitutional. Or take a matter that's now pending before the Supreme Court, affirmative action. There are two cases that were argued on October 31st, Students for Fair Admission versus University of North Carolina and Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard College is whether the Supreme Court should overrule 45 years of precedent and hold that college universities can't engage in affirmative action. I think if one is an originalist, the evidence is overwhelming that the framers of the 14th Amendment meant to allow race-conscious programs of the sort today we would call affirmative action. The same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment also created programs like the Freedmen's Bureau. There's compelling scholarship by legal historians that from an originalist perspective, affirmative action is permissible. Stephen Siegel wrote an article in the Northwestern Law Review maybe 30 years ago that went through the legal history in detail and said it supports the constitutionality of affirmative action. Yet I have no doubt that the Supreme Court in a six to three decision is going to overrule the prior cases. Region of the California versus Bakke. Gruda versus Bollinger, you know, Fisher versus University of Texas, and hold that affirmative action is unconstitutional. This is what I mean by the hypocrisy problem. It also fits with what I said earlier, how I think what the conservative justices do is come to conservative conclusions, and then, for originalism supports it, find the historical evidence that lends to their conclusion, but if not, they just ignore originalism. If you look at, say, Justice Scalia and just Thomas' dissent in the early affirmative action cases, they strongly oppose affirmative action, but originalism plays no role at all in their writing. So what I've tried to do is very quickly outline some of the major problems that I see with originalism. What's the alternative to originalism? Justice Scalia was fond of saying, I have a theory, originalism, and they don't. That's actually what led to the title of my book, Worse Than Nothing. It was meant to respond to Justice Scalia here. Throughout American history, the Supreme Court has consulted 
multiple sources in interpreting the Constitution. All justices, liberal and conservative, start with the text of the Constitution. Rarely, though, is the text going to provide an answer for the cases that come before the court. What's cruel and unusual punishment? What's due process of law? What's liberty protected in the Constitution? What's equal protection? Inevitably, justice look beyond the text. I think all justices will consult the original meaning. That doesn't mean it's decisive for a non-originalist justice. It's just one more thing to consider. The structure of the Constitution is often informative. History and tradition is relevant. Precedent matters. Modern social needs are relevant. Originalists will look only at the text in the original meaning. Non-originalist justices will look at all of the different sources. Now, the criticism is this doesn't lead to determinate results. It leaves justices too much discretion. But I'd suggest to you that justices have great discretion under originalism or any method of interpreting the Constitution. In part, that's because the historical record is clear or inapt. In part, it's because the justices don't follow originalism or doesn't get the results they want. But there's also another reason. Virtually no constitutional right is absolute. Inevitably, there's balancing. Under strict scrutiny, the justice has to decide what's compelling government interest. Under an immediate scrutiny, the justice has to decide what's an important interest. Under rational basis review, the justice has to decide what's a legitimate interest. There's no formula, no test for determining what's compelling or important or legitimate. It's never answered on the basis of originalism. It's a value choice by the justice. And so there's no way to have value neutral judging. In fact, a century ago, the legal realists taught us all that formalism is impossible. That there's no legal set of legal principles that's out there just to be discovered. That's what Justice Felix Frankfurter meant when he said in Guarantee Trust versus York in 1940, Law is not a brooding omnipresence. And there's no way to reason from premises without there being judicial discretion. Inevitably, constitutional law is about value choices. What's a sufficient interest to justify interfering with free speech? What's an unreasonable search and seizure? Or they said, what's cruel and unusual punishment? All justices have to answer these questions. Originalists are answering them too, but they're pretending that the answers are coming from ex some external source. I think what's so important is that we all acknowledge that these are value choices to be made and then to debate those value choices. I end my book, Worse Than Nothing, by saying, I think we all should be afraid of originalism. That if original is followed, it will radically change the meaning of the Constitution. Take a simple example. The rights to privacy that are protected under the liberty of the due process clause. I completed the manuscript for my book in October of 2021, and I predicted that the Supreme Court following originalism would overrule Roe versus Wade. It happened, of course, on June 24th of 2022. But pause for a moment and think of all of the rights that the Supreme Court has safeguarded under the liberty of the due process clause, even though they're not enumerated in the text, even though they're not part of the original meaning. The right to marry. The right to procreate. The right to custody of one's children. The right to keep the family together. The right of parents to control the upbringing of their children. The right to purchase and use contraceptives. The right of consenting adults to engage in private, consensual, same-sex sexual activity. The right of competent adults to refuse medical care. None of those rights can be justified from an originalist perspective. 
In a concurring opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson was helped last June 24th, Justice Thomas said, now that we've overruled Roe, we should overrule Griswold versus Connecticut, the 1965 case that said that states cannot prohibit the sale, distribution, or use of contraceptives. He said we should overrule Lawrence versus Texas, the 2003 decision that a state cannot criminally prohibit private, consensual, adult, same-sex sexual activity. And he said we should overrule Obergefell versus Hodges, the case I mentioned earlier from 2015, that states cannot prohibit same-sex marriage. Justice Alito's majority opinion said, none of those other rights are in jeopardy because they don't involve potential life. But as the dissent pointed out, from the criteria the majority articulated in Dobbs, none of those rights should be in the, protected under the Constitution. None are in the text. None are part of its original meaning. And none have a history going back to the founding of the Constitution. The dissent said, the majority is saying, quote, scouts honor, trust us, we're not going to overrule those rights. But if the court adheres to originalism, none of those rights can survive. And that's why I say we should all be afraid of the consequences of originalism. I think I've used my time to talk, and I'm glad now to take questions. You can raise hand and ask questions. Um, if you put them in the chat, if somebody doesn't mind reading them to me, I'd be glad to take questions that way, too. Thank you very much, Dita Marinsky. Uh, I would like to say whether you have privileges, but I already see that there is uh, uh, someone who wants to jump in with uh, a question. Uh, Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself and, and uh, send me your question? Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the uh, terrific talk. Um, I have 100 questions, but I will limit myself to one for the moment. Um, so let me start. I'm completely completely convinced by your account. Um, I especially love your, your personal story of the drafting uh, of the Californian uh, Constitution. Um, but as you know, like having the better argument obviously does not necessarily translate into winning the argument. And it seems to me that on the political stage in the US right now, the other side is winning the the political argument, right? So last year, when a when a liberal justice for the Supreme Court was confirmed, she made sure to to assure the congressman and women that she is not opposed to originalism. I know a lot of papers from liberal law professors who try to use originalism to push back against the reasoning of um, of conservative justices. Um, so, so right now, while the while the while there might be substantial pushback against some conservative originalist judgments, there seems to be little pushback uh, against the methodology as such. And to me, this is kind of surprising because um, if you look at it from a comparative perspective, normally everything that comes from the U.S. Uh, from U.S. law schools translates immediately to to other other country systems as well. So law and econ, critical legal studies were heavily influence, uh, uh, influential in other systems as well, but um, that's not the same as originalism, right? So I can speak at least for, for Europe that um, no actor that I know of, judicial or academic, is really proposing the exclusiveness of, of originalism. Um, to be honest, they, they are not really discussing it. They don't really care about it that much. So my question is, do you have any theory on why the US story is so different in this regard. So why, why is it so much harder for you to get your, I think, very convincing argument across in the US discourse? It's a wonderful question. If Hillary Clinton had won the 2016 presidential election, and if she had picked three justices rather than Donald Trump, there would only be one originalist on the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas. Originalism would have been relegated to his dissents and to conservative criticism of liberal Supreme Court decisions. Donald Trump winning means there's a solid conservative majority on the Supreme Court, six conservative justices. Conservatives have embraced originalism since the early 1970s as the way of criticizing liberal decisions. Initially, the Warren Court and then of Roe versus Wade. So some of your answer is the political nature of originalism. Some of it is, it's simple. I mean, it's so simple to say, we don't want justices to be imposing their own values. We want to constrain justices. So we should follow the original meaning of the framers. 
That sounds so easy. And I think that that's part of the political appeal of originalism. And yet I'm not sure that the originalists are winning. When the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade, two thirds of Americans thought that the Supreme Court made a terrible decision and believed that Roe should not have been overruled. I don't think those two thirds of Americans thought that the right to abortion was part of the original meaning of the constitution. We've seen the political implications of the Supreme Court overruling Roe. The Supreme Court has its lowest approval ratings of any point in American history. So I don't know that, that the public is accepting the originalism of the Supreme Court. Um, why haven't foreign countries looked to originalism? Because I think originalism is so tied to the politics of the United States. It's so much been the way that conservatives have chosen to criticize liberal decisions. So I said, that's how it started in the early 1970s to criticize the Warren Court. It gained fuel as a way of criticizing Roe versus Wade. And then it was propelled by the conservative Federalist Society. I don't think that that would have an analogy in foreign countries. And yet, let me just qualify at the end by saying, issues of interpretation do arise in foreign countries. They arise in all contexts. In the context of religion, there's certainly debates over how text should be interpreted. In literature, there's debates of how text should be interpreted. So questions of interpretation are inevitable. Original, it seems to me, just so tied to the unique politics of the United States. Uh, Vanessa, we have um, Martha McDowell. We have Martha yeah. McDowell, please. Can you introduce yes. yourself as well? Yeah, I'm Martha McDougall doing a PhD in law in Canada. I'm in Ottawa as I speak. Um, and I'm doing it in an area of constitutional law never done before. Um, and it's um, whether or not uh, a member of the military can have a contract with the state. And uh, the uh, answer in the case law is no. Um, and it's uh, the, I'm using a historical methodology to prove my, prove that this case law is correct. Uh, this case law under positivism has been heavily criticized as being out of date. So what I, my question is the following is that how do I use a historical methodology, which is the only way I can arrive at my conclusion without um, getting into the fallacy or the problem of originalism. I think there's an important distinction between considering history where it's there as part of analysis and deeming historical analysis to be decisive and conclusive. I certainly, if I was dealing with a constitutional issue, would be interested in knowing what did people think on all sides when the provision was adopted? Was there any original understanding of the words? I wouldn't end my analysis there. I would let that be part of the analysis. And to me, what's wrong with originalists is they stop at that point. The fact that the framers in 1791 didn't think to allow a law that would keep those with a restraining order in domestic violence cases from having guns. We can know it's historically true, but to me, it shouldn't be decisive. I mean, when we look at how domestic violence was regarded in 1791 compared to in 2023, we say, you know, that's not a place we really want to follow or the way in which the law looked at married women in 1791. Thankfully, we don't do that anymore. So to me, when the Fifth Circuit says, well, this wasn't allowed in 1791, yeah, that's interesting, but this is a place where it shouldn't be decisive. So my answer is, of course, we should look at history where it's there, but it's just one of the factors to consider. Maybe in some instances, it's so compelling that that's what we should follow. But in other instances, we say, yes, in 1868, Congress meant to allow segregation, but that doesn't tell us that today the law should allow segregation. Thank you very much. We have another question from Christopher Mohawi. Do you want to introduce yourself, Christopher? Yes. Um, 
So thank you very much. My name is Christopher. I'm a GSD student at the University of Illinois in the College of Law. So my question is in regard to um, the, the Supreme Court's interpretation of um, Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution in regard to, you know, the cases and controversy issue. And from the history that I've read, it became prominent from the 1970s. And so the interpretation currently as it is, and from the instruction of uh, the different cases from the Supreme Court is to the extent that the plaintiff must have suffered um, injury that is either actual or, or imminent. And, and I've discussed with a few professors who agree and others do disagree. So uh, from this discussion, I would want to get the professor's mind on uh, the origin of this rather as quoted by one of my advisors, uh, absurdity of uh, 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 the interpretation of what a case or controversy is to mean that the plaintiff must have suffered injury for them to get redress from the court. Um, that's my question precisely. Thank you. The Supreme Court, as you allude to, has interpreted cases and controversies as giving rise to a series of limits on the federal judicial power. Standing is one of those doctrines. And one of the requirements for standing, as you say, is the plaintiff has to show that he or she has been injured or imminently will be injured. The plaintiff also has to show that the injury was caused by the defendant and that a favorable court decision will remedy the injury. The Supreme Court has developed a doctrine called ripeness, a doctrine called mootness, based on case and controversies. All of those are doctrines that developed in the 20th century. In fact, to a very large extent, those doctrines develop from the 1970s on, so just in the last 50 years. You're not going to find any discussion at the Constitutional Convention or among James Madison about standing to sue or the injury requirement. Um, so this is a place where the court has created doctrines that can't be possibly justified from originalism. Um, there's excellent scholarship that's been done about the origins of the cases and controversies requirement. There's an article by Susan Bandes, B-A-N-D-E-S, in Stanford Law Review, or maybe 30 years ago, titled The Idea of a Case. There's an article by William Fletcher in the Yale Law Journal on the meaning of standing that does a really good historical analysis. Um, so those would be places to look. If you want an example of a Supreme Court case from just a couple of years ago where this becomes important, it's a case called um, TransUnion versus Ramirez. And the Supreme Court said, Congress, by statute, can create an injury that gives rise to standing only if it's a type of injury that was recognized at common law. Well, this then puts in jeopardy many federal statutes. Think of the Federal Freedom Information Act. It says that all documents possessed by the federal government can be obtained by any person unless they fit in one of nine categories of exemption. And it authorizes someone to sue if their request is denied. I don't know how that can continue under TransUnion versus Ramirez because this didn't exist until the mid-1960s. So I think you raise a great question. And to me, what the court has done here can't be justified from an originalist perspective. And to try to do so leads to absurd conclusions because we're taking modern doctrine and trying to apply it in a historical way where there isn't any context to do so. Thank you very much, Dean. We have another question from Simonson, please, Simon. Yes, um, so um, I think similar to Daniel, when I first learned about originalism, um, I was very uh, astonished by the the length, um, the depth of you know, discussion on that. Uh, my grandfather was a Supreme Court justice. He's considered as a conservative, conservative but he never employed such methodology, um, even though he's considered as a conservative um, justice. So, so this itself, um, this discussion is very meaningful. Um, my, my question here is that when I was reading your book, um, most um, most scenarios you're mentioning are, are you, you focus on court decisions and justice who apply originalism. So my question is, is there a meaningful difference that in your research that there's a difference between originalism by the justice versus originalism by the scholars, whereas they might have a 
more nuanced understanding of originalism um, there, and maybe the, how the justice employed original might be at fault uh, and sub point. Yes, in two ways. First, the scholars have moved much more to original meaning originalism and very much away from framers' intent originalism, but the justices haven't. My evidence of that is the Kennedy, in case I mentioned Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, June 27, 2022, where Justice Gorsuch, writing for a six person majority, says, We determine the meaning of the Establishment Clause by the views of, quote, his, his words, the founding fathers. There's another way in which there's a difference. Some scholars have developed a version of originalism that looks at the more abstract goals of the framers, not their specific intent. Jack Balkin in a book called Living Originalism, William Bowd in an article in the Columbia Law Review. The problem with this though is, if you state the goals of the framers at a general intent, then anything can be justified under it in that the constraint that's just the base for originalism vanishes. So you could say, with regard to segregation, the general intent of the Equal Protection Clause was to prevent racial subordination. Therefore, segregation is wrong. And ignore the fact that the same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment voted to segregate the District of Columbia Public Schools. Or you could say the general goal of the word liberty was to protect autonomy. So it's consistent with originalism to allow for the court to prohibit state laws that outlaw same-sex marriage. But if that becomes originalism, then originalism is indistinguishable from non-originalism. Because if you state the goals of any constitutional provision in an abstract enough way, you can justify any result. I can justify Roe versus Wade by saying, well, from an original perspective, the word liberty was meant to protect fundamental aspects of autonomy. So there are scholars who have taken originalism in that direction, and I agree with them, but I think originalism becomes indistinguishable then from non-originalism. Thank, Thank you very much, Dean. I guess I'm going to take uh, moderator's privileges now uh, because I, I really appreciate the efforts uh, you did to highlight the disparity and inequalities of that time and that the people's intention was limited to only a subset of uh, what we would call today uh, privileged individuals. So um, your account of your book is mostly a response to the late Justice Scalia. So mainly stating that there is an interpretative problem in constitutional law that has not been solved by originalism. And my question is, since some scholars uh, consider that originalism is also historical interpretation context, or to give content. Is there any space for that sort of interpretative factor to ambiguous constitutional provisions? I don't think the book is primarily response to Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia was a foremost proponent of originalism. And so I certainly respond to him, but Justice Thomas is an originalist and respond to the originalist scholars. Um, in the answer to your specific question, I think my answer would be, of course, it's worth looking at his history and, and learning what we can from history. It's just we shouldn't be bound by history. There's got to be a better reason to do something than that's the way it's always been done. There's got to be a better reason for interpreting the Constitution than that's what people in 1787 or 1791 thought. Does that answer your question or am I missing your question? Uh, Vanessa, we have a question from the chat uh, uh, from Chris uh, Fabry. Um, she asks, um, uh, should be, what, what should be done when it comes to both the Senate filibuster and the Article 5 of the Constitution? Um, the Supreme Court got to have the final say on so many issues because of those two combined uh, factors. I think the filibuster is unconstitutional. I argued this in an article that I co-authored with Catherine Fisk. It's in the 1995 Stanford Law Review titled The Filibuster, but I don't see any likely that courts will declare the filibuster unconstitutional. Obviously we're short of time, so I can't develop the argument here, but simply put, where the constitution wants a supermajority to do something, 
It says so. It takes two thirds of the Senate to approve a treaty. And we can go through other places where the constitution says, it takes super majority. Uh, the effect of the filibuster is to require that, except for budget legislation, everything else takes 60 votes to pass the Senate. And I'd argue that's unconstitutional, but I don't see a likelihood the court's going to strike it down. But I agree with you that the filibuster is an enormous problem. I'm not quite sure what you mean in terms of Article 5. I think a crucial problem under the Constitution is that every state gets two senators regardless of size. In 1787, the difference between the largest state, Virginia, and the smallest state, Delaware, was eight to one. Today, the difference between the largest state in population, California, and Wyoming is almost 70 to one. But Article 5 of the Constitution says that that's one provision that each state gets equal representation in the Senate that can't be changed. Maybe what you're referring to as Article 5 is how difficult it is to amend the Constitution. And because it is so hard to amend the Constitution, there seems little alternative but to do it by interpretation. And I think that requires non-originalism. I hope I addressed your question. Yeah, I think Chris, uh, she also, or he also uh, kind of explained uh, further uh, saying that um, previously, like, um, isn't it related to the fact that first, both the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights are so ancient, it's become virtually impossible to amend the U.S. Constitution, and European Constitution are easier to amend, and most of them were drafted early, after the Second World War. Yes. Um, it takes two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the states to amend the Constitution. Since 1787, it's been amended only 27 times. Since 1791, it's only been amended 17 times. And because amendment is so difficult, it's not impossible, that really leaves no alternative but interpretation to make the Constitution meaningful and apply to our modern world. Thank you very much, Lindsay Marinsky. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, we are excited to have you today as our third speaker of law science. Um, and uh, I will ask everyone to join me and uh, uh, give an applause to Lindsay Marinsky for today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Truly my pleasure. Delighted to do it. Take care, everyone. Be well. Thank you oh, thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.